one of the greatest revolutionaries of the 20th century, Thomas Sankara was the first president of Burkina Faso. He rose to power through a coup d'etat and changed the nation previously known as Upper Volta in tremendous ways. Sankara led his country from the years of 1983 to 1987 before he was betrayed by his friend, and was assassinated with help from the French. But this video is not a biography of Sankara's life. Instead, this serves to highlight five of his famous speeches that described his philosophy, political ideology, and way of governing. Showing how he planned and successfully eradicated his nation from colonial rule, and how his Marxist beliefs brought millions of Burkinab out of poverty. These speeches were obtained from the book, We Are the Heirs of the World's Revolutions. But before we begin, let's look at Burkina Faso before and after Sankara's presidency. As previously stated, Burkina Faso was a colonial French state under the name Upper Volta. At the time of the revolution, Upper Volta had 90% of its population living in rural areas. The average yearly income per person was about $151. The illiteracy rate was 13% with 98% of people in rural areas being illiterate. Upper Volta had the highest infant mortality rate in the world with a life expectancy of about 44 years. After Sankara took power, he changed the name of his country from Upper Volta to Burkina Faso, the land of incorruptible people. Fun fact, he was even a talented guitarist and composed the Burkina Faso national anthem. In only four years of power, Sankara vaccinated 2.5 million children against meningitis, yellow fever, and measles. Decreasing the infant mortality from 208 for every 1,000 live births to 145 out of 1,000, initiated a nationwide literacy campaign, increasing the literacy rate from 13% in 1983 to 73% in 1987. Planted over 10 million trees in the fight against deforestation. Built roads, railways, schools, and housing. Nationalized the land to guarantee the rural people, who accounted to 90% of the population, access to the fruits of their labor. He appointed females to high governmental positions, encouraged them to work, recruited them into the military, and granted pregnancy leave during education. He outlawed female genital mutilation, forced marriages, and polygamy in support of women's rights. And there are many more examples of socio-economic development that Sankara gave to his people. Keep in mind, he did all of this without foreign aid. An incredible feat for a former colony in the continent of Africa. The reason Sankara was so special was that he was an African leader that valued his Marxist-Leninist and Pan-African ideology. Now that's enough facts about what Thomas Sankara did for his nation, now let's go over the five speeches he gave all around the world. Speech 1 Political Orientation Speech This first speech was broadcasted on radio and television throughout Burkina Faso on 2 October 1983. In this speech at the beginning of his presidency, Sankara discusses Burkina Faso's history till then and how he was planning to change its future. He states that the revolution was not just fought by the Committee for the Defense of the Revolution to overthrow the corrupt people in office, but, the result of the Voltaic people's struggle against their long-standing enemies those enemies being international imperialism and its national allies, this being France. To him, the revolution was the popular masses aspiring for democracy, liberty, independence, and genuine progress. Giving the Birkin of their dignity back from the neo-colonial powers that stole it from them. He goes on to discuss the 23 years of colonialism that Burkina Faso endured. He highlights the French defeat at Dien Bien Phu in 1960 which marked the end of French colonialism and gave Vietnam her liberation. He asserts that this defeat made the petty bourgeois fear that the struggle of the popular masses will lead to more revolutions against imperialism, so they were forced to change their game plan. Sankara states that the French utilized Voltaic nationals as agents of their foreign domination and exploitation. This new technique was prevalent at the time foreshadowing Sankara's fate when he was assassinated with the help of his former, revolutionary comrade Blaise Compare. Everything in Upper Volta was replaced in order to create a neo-colonial society, such as the administration, the army, and schools, all this to serve imperialist interests. This process made it easier for Voltaic nationals to plunder the country. It made them into a bourgeois class, known for its corruption, embezzlement of public funds and properties, and practicing favoritism and nepotism. They exploited the working people all for their self-interest going on extravagant trips, having their children attend prestigious schools, and being able to access luxurious healthcare abroad. Do these practices by officials remind you of anyone in the continent of Africa? 
well, yes that's because it's still prevalent today. While the rich live in heaven, the poor live in hell. The wage earners suffer the constraints and pitfalls of capitalist consumer society. They spend their entire wage before it has even been received. This is a common theme of capitalism and is ubiquitous in the 21st century. The sole reason that the economy survives is because of the working class and its productive labor. Songkara states, even though they create the wealth, it is the peasants who suffer most from the lack of buildings, road infrastructure, healthcare facilities, and schooling. As previously stated, the literacy rate among peasants was 98%, there was also a lack of jobs that forced people to move abroad where they will be exploited as well. He further states, after 23 years of imperialist domination and exploitation, our country remains a backward agricultural country, where the rural sector which is 90% of the workforce only accounted for 45% of the GDP. The rural peasants also experience famine which forces them to rely on imported goods and international aid. These statistics were hard for Sankara to utter but it was a great reminder to the Birkinab of the horrible treatment they were subjected to under imperialism. Upper Volta imported more than they exported, leading the nation to an inevitable economic catastrophe. Sankara also mentions the predatory foreign investments that Upper Volta relied upon, with 70% of the funds paying the salaries of civil servants. This is the historical context that led the Burkina people to support the August Revolution by the National Council of the Revolution. He then shifts his focus to the parasitic classes of neocolonial Upper Volta and knew that they would try to reconquer their power, because they were tied to their imperialist kingdom by an umbilical cord. He confronts the bourgeois by stating, the only language they respond to and understand is the language of struggle, for them, our revolution will be the most authoritarian thing that exists. He calls out these parasitic classes by name, first the Voltaic bourgeoisie, which includes the state bourgeois, the commercial bourgeoisie, and the middle bourgeoisie. Second, are the reactionary forces that base their power on feudal-type structures of society. Although they helped fight against the French, they still took away power from the peasant class. Sankara planned to give more responsibilities to these peasants and educate them more. He states that these are the enemies of the people. He describes the Burkinab people after the revolution, first the Voltaic working class, young and few in number, but a remarkable revolutionary class with nothing to lose and everything to gain, then the petty bourgeoisie, a large majority that always takes the side of the popular masses, third the Voltaic peasantry, the big majority, tied to small plots of land and small production due to capitalism, they embody the productive relations of the bourgeois an integral category for them, and finally the lumpen proletariat, or the declassed individuals without jobs that hire themselves out to reactionary and counter-revolutionary forces to carry out the bourgeois dirty work. Sankara hopes that the latter can instead become defenders. Sankara reiterates, that the August Revolution was both a democratic and popular revolution whose main tasks were to eliminate imperialist domination and exploitation and to purge the rural peasants of all social and economic obstacles that keep it in a backward state. He continues to state that the best way to defend the revolution is for the people to be clear on the meaning of the revolution so that the counter-revolutionaries cannot use it against them. Sankara's regime planned to build a new voltaic society driven by revolutionary consciousness. He finishes this speech by foretelling the transformations he would do for the national army, policies concerning women, and economic development. For the national army, he believed that a conscious people cannot leave their homeland's defense to one group of men they have to take charge of themselves. Sankara planned to change the national armed forces by having them be able to combat all internal and external enemies and train the rest of the people to participate in national production because a soldier must live and suffer among the people to which he belongs. This included fieldwork, raising cattle, building schools and hospitals, maintaining roads, and many more tasks. In general, the army would work at the service of the people. Second, for the Voltaic women, Sankara says in one of his most famous quotes, we do not talk of women's emancipation as an act of charity. It is a basic necessity for the revolution to triumph. Women hold up the other half of the sky. Equal rights for women were a mandatory step in the development of Burkina Faso, and Sankara acknowledged the important role women played in the betterment of society, a disfavored idea at the time on the continent. Sankara vowed to give women the power to conceive projects, make and implement decisions, and give them equal rights to men in all spheres. Finally, the transformation of the national economy would lead to agrarian reform, administrative reform, educational reform, and the reform of the structures of production and distribution in the modern sector. 
Tsongkhara wanted to increase labor productivity, by better organizing peasants and introducing modern agricultural techniques in the countryside. Burkina Faso's development would rely upon its best feature, its agriculture. By defending its agriculture from being dominated by imperialism, giving peasants higher wages, and ensuring markets year-round. The nation's production and distribution would finally be controlled by the Voltaic people. As for schools, the graduates would serve the popular masses, not their own interests. Healthcare would be available to everyone, adding an increase in the number of vaccination campaigns. Songkara also planned to end rent gouging by implementing reasonable rents, he also vowed to end conflicts between ethnic groups uniting the people under one cause. As for foreign policy, Songkara had respect for each other's independence, and his main tenets were for mutual non-aggression and non-interference in domestic affairs. Burkina Faso would give solidarity and support to national liberation movements fighting for the independence of their countries and people, like in Namibia under Swapo, the Sahrawi people, and the Palestinians under the Zionist Israelis stealing their land. He ends the speech by stating that the African countries are allies in Burkina Faso's struggle, and he hoped he can make closer ties with them. Homeland or death, we will win. Speech 2, Freedom Must Be Conquered in Struggle in this second speech, Thomas Sankara addresses the 39th session of the United Nations Assembly in New York. He speaks to the Council on behalf of his nation and people, criticizing the West, directly, for its colonial influence on the African continent. Sankara was known for being ahead of his time, and this was a daring message to give to the powers that destabilized his nation. He references the struggle his nation had faced and how it planned to carry forward to economic prosperity. He prefaces his speech by asserting that he is speaking on behalf of the great disinherited people of the world, the world deemed the third world. Sanakara hoped to have a unified solidarity with all third world nations in the three continents of Asia, Latin America, and Africa in a single struggle against the economic exploiters. He claims that until now, the developing nations have been turning the other cheek after receiving blows from imperialist powers. That the word of Jesus Christ was betrayed, these evil powers obscured the message of Christ and westernized it, whereas we have understood it as one of universal liberation. But after opening our eyes to class struggle, there will be no more blows. He defies the charlatans that have tried to sell their false promises to the proletariat. The honest scholars and intellectuals of the third world are realizing the cons being made by so-called third world experts in developing their nations. Songkara states that the educated petty bourgeoisie of Africa is not prepared to give up their privileges. Songkara wanted these elite men of Africa and the third world to come back to who they are. To help their nations break from foreign domination and exploitation. Songkara told the audience that this was part of the basis for the August Revolution in 1983. He was frustrated with seeing elites in limousines driving around, while the urban masses struggled. He states, the poor man's grain in our countries has fattened the rich man's cow. Next, he discusses the forms of foreign aid that inundated his country. He acknowledged that this aid is supposed to work in the interest of their development, but that was not present and funds were not adequately distributed by the men in power due to either navit or class selfishness. He cites a book by Jacques Guiri, Le Sahel Domaine, in which Guiri claims, the only goal of this foreign aid is to continue developing non-productive sectors, resulting in heavy expenditures, disorganizing the countryside, widening the trade deficit, and accelerating our indebtedness. Songkara agreed with Giri, since the proof was present to him in his own country. Sanakra further acknowledges the need for aid, but in general welfare and aid policies have only disorganized us, subjugating us, and robbing us of a sense of responsibility for our country's own economic, political, and cultural affairs. Songkara told the council that he chose to risk new paths to achieve greater well-being. New techniques that would be better suited for their civilization. He then states another one of his famous quotes, immersing our army in the people through productive labor and reminding it constantly that without patriotic political education, a soldier is only a potential criminal. Songkara then explains the work the Burkina government has already started in order to develop its nation. With the help of the National Solidarity Fund, he planned to address the drought problems plaguing many Burkinab citizens, by working with the UN to help the people achieve food self-sufficiency. They introduced the Teach Our Children raffle which was a campaign to educate and train children in the ways of education. The commander launched a vast program that built 500 units of public housing in three months. He was disappointed that children were dying of diseases like malaria or diarrhea when they were easily curable. 
he spoke for those children as well as artists, journalists, and athletes that were all exploited by colonialism. He also speaks in behalf of the Palestinians, in which he states, I think of the valiant Palestinian people, that is, these shattered families wandering across the world in search of refugee. Courageous determined stoic and untiring, the Palestinians remind every human conscience of the moral necessity and obligation to respect the rights of people. He continues to mention the countless struggle in other nations in the so-called Third World, and reiterates that Burkina Faso wishes to be the heirs of all the world's revolutions, and all the liberation struggles of the peoples of the Third World. Towards the end of his speech, he addresses the President of the United Nations stating that the reason why he came to speak in front of the General Assembly is because the United Nations remains the ideal forum for our demands, the place where countries without voices must appear to be considered legitimate. Sankara was using this platform to put forth the demands of the rights for the underdeveloped world that being the right to independence, free choice of governmental forms, and gene real people rights. He had high hopes for an organization like the UN and expected more from it. If Sankara were alive today, I believe he would be sad to see the failure that the UN has become not representing all nations equally. Sankara then pays homage to Fidel Castro's speech to the Non-Aligned Summit meeting in 1979, in which Castro declared, $300 billion is enough to build 600,000 schools a year with a capacity of 400 million children, or 60 million comfortable homes with a capacity of 300 million people, or 50,000 hospitals with 18 million beds or 20,000 factories to provide employment for more than 20 million workers, or create irrigation systems for 150 million hectares of land, providing food for a billion people. For Sankara, he and Castro's were the same. They hoped the UN could instead use the money they use for the military and direct it to investment in education, healthcare, housing, and other necessities for a society to function. He then returns to the topic of Palestine and calls out the atrocities that the State of Israel has inflicted upon them. He states, the most pitiful and appalling record in terms of arrogance, insolence, and incredible stubbornness is held by a small country in the Middle East, Israel. With the complicity of its powerful protector, the United States. Israel has continued to defy the international community for more than 20 years. He continues, scorning history, which only yesterday condemned each Jew to the horror of the gas chamber, Israel has now ended up inflicting on others an ordeal that was once its own. He then puts forth his support for the Palestinian people, through both militancy and active solidarity to the combatants. In regards to the Palestinian struggle, Sankara was ahead of his time, choosing to spend part of his speech advocating for the liberation of Palestinians while exposing Israel's evils that are supported by the US. He continues to address the wrongdoings of colonial powers like apartheid in South Africa and its control of Namibia. He tells the president, it is our blood that fed the rapid development of capitalism, that made possible our current state of dependence and that consolidated our underdevelopment. Sankara ends his speech hoping that the international community will discover the truth of capitalism and colonialism's plague on the developing world, and that their demands of rights to development are on the basis of total equality, through organization and redistribution of human resources. He and the Burkina people would not accept the slightest denial of justice on the slightest bit of this earth. He calls for Nelson Mandela to be freed, for space research budgets to be cut by 1% and for the funds devoted to research in health and the restoration of the environment. And lastly, a bold but important ask, that Israel suspended and South Africa expelled from the United Nations. He ends by thanking the United Nations for its work in Burkina Faso, and he hopes that the UN will begin fighting against the extermination of 30 million humans every year by hunger. His closing words were, homeland or death, we will win. Speech 3, Imperialism is the arsonist of our forests and savannas. This third speech was given at the first International Silver Conference for the Protection of the Trees and Forests in Paris in early, 1986. In this speech Sankara addresses the detrimental effects imperialism has had on trees and our environment as a whole. This was a remarkable and unique cause to support at the time, and further supports the idea that Sankara was ideologically ahead of his time. Again, he speaks in behalf of the Burkinab people who have seen their natural environment die and refuse to see it go. He states, for nearly three years now, my people, the Burkinab, have been fighting a battle against the encroachment of the desert. He mentions the importance of trees in Burkinab culture. Whenever there is a happy event such as marriages, baptisms, or visits from prominent individuals it is celebrated with a tree planting ceremony. 
the children of Burkina Faso built more than 3,500 improved cookstoves by hand to give to their mothers, and the women made an additional 80,000 cookstoves in order to reduce the consumption of firewood. He continues to highlight the achievements that he helped lead over the past three years, such as vaccinating 2.5 million children and raising the literacy rate from 12 to 22 percent in two years, their next step was to create a green Burkina. The people planted 10 million trees in 15 months under the People's Development Program. They also structured the cutting and selling of firewood. He then states that in the following months, more than 35,000 peasants will take courses relating to economic management and environmental organization and maintenance. He reaffirms that these policy changes are meant to create a sincere love between the Burkina people and trees in his homeland. This speech aimed to showcase the environmental victories of the Burkina people, and also to denounce the imperialists that have decimated our forests without the slightest thought of how it will affect future generations. In general, Sankara wanted to establish a balance between man, nature, and society. He proposes that at least 1% of the space exploration budget should be used to finance projects to save trees and lives. His main thought being, why focus on the possibilities of a new world and people in space when we can't even take of our own land and people here on Earth? He calls out the hypocrisy that we spend so much money drilling oil wells 3,000 meters deep, while we can't afford to drill wells for drinking water. He then quotes Karl Marx, stating, those who live in a palace do not think about the same things, nor in the same way, as those who live in a hut. Overall to Sankara, defending the trees and forests is all just a struggle against imperialism because imperialism is the arsonist setting fire to our forests and our savannas. Homeland or death, we will win. Speech 4, French enables us to communicate with other peoples in struggle. In this fourth speech, Thomas Sankara speaks about the effect that French colonialism has had on its colonies in a linguistic sense, and how these colonies can use the French language to unite. He begins, stating that, as a result of colonialism, we have become part of the French-speaking world, even though only 10% of Burkinabs speak the language. Sankara has two preconditions to be part of the French-speaking world. First that the French language is only a means of expressing reality, and second that like any other language French should open itself up to understanding its own evolution. Sankara acknowledges that initially, French was the language of the colonizer, but through that language the Burkina people were able to understand the dialectical method of analyzing imperialism, allowing the people to organize themselves politically and revolt. The thing about Sankara we should keep in mind is that he always saw the good in something, no matter how bad it was. With French, the Burkina were able to communicate with other peoples. To him, there were two French languages, the French spoken by metropolitan France, and the French spoken on the five continents. He wanted the French colonies to ask is how they could use French to bring themselves together, to fight a common struggle. This shared struggle with the Vietnamese people, the Caledonian people for example. Through the French language, the people are able to read the great educators of the proletariat in the service of class struggle. Sankara then importantly proclaims, we should use this language in conformity with our militant internationalism, that with unity will emerge shared convictions because we all suffer the same exploitation and the same oppression. Sankara also hopes that the French language can accept words and idioms from other languages and integrate it. For instance, he speaks about the Arabic words of Islam or Baraka, because in his opinion the Arabic language expresses meanings better than any other. He states, to refuse to integrate the languages of others into French is to erect barriers of cultural chauvinism. To him this is hypocrisy since other languages have accepted terms from the French language that are untranslatable in their own. Like the English words aristocratic, bourgeois, and champagne. Sankara brilliantly highlights that the African languages of Puel, Moor, Bantu, and Wolof have assimilated while the oppressors have not. He ends his speech with a powerful quote, to refuse to integrate other languages is to be unaware of the roots and history of one's own, because every language is the product of several others. Burkina Faso opened itself to other peoples and counts heavily on the cultures of others to grow richer. Sankara predicted that we would be heading towards a universal civilization that will lead to a universal language. That is the framework for their use of French. Sankara's prediction seems to be coming true as globalization and technology is connecting the world with English being the lingua franca. Speech 5, You Cannot Kill Ideas This fifth and final speech was given one week before Sankara's assassination on 8 October, 1987. It is a tribute to the great revolutionary Ernesto Che Guevara who was a great inspiration for Sankara. 
This speech was given in front of a Cuban delegation in attendance, which included Che's son Camilo Guevara March. People like to claim that Sankara is the Che of Africa, but titles like these take away from the fact that these are two different revolutionaries who have completely unique stories. Nevertheless, Sankara had the utmost respect for Che, and his final speech before he was killed was a tribute to the Argentinian revolutionary. In this speech, Sankara asserts that to him Che Guevara is not dead. Because as long as there are people across the globe fighting for freedom, dignity, and justice. Fighting against oppression and domination, against colonialism, neo-colonialism, and imperialism, then Che's struggle still lives on. He wanted the people of Burkina Faso to understand Che, who wanted to light fires of struggle throughout the world. Even though Che was cut down by imperialist bullets in Bolivia, he is not dead. Sankara mentions a story of when Fidel Castro heard a soldier in the Cuban Revolution utter famous words before he was killed by Batista's army. Before he was shot he said, don't shoot, you cannot kill ideas, and indeed that is true. Sankara told his people that you cannot kill ideas, ideas do not die. Because of that reason, Che Guevara, an embodiment of revolutionary ideas and self-sacrifice is not dead. Sankara highlights that although originally Argentinian, Guevara became an adopted Cuban through the blood and sweat he shed for the Cuban people. He became a citizen of the world, the free world that he wanted to build and that's why he stated that Guevara is also African and Burkinab. Sankara states, Che is Burkinab because he participates in our struggle. He is Burkini because his ideas inspire us and live with us in the daily struggle we wage. Sankara continues stating that Che is also a sense of humanity. Humanity being the expression of generosity and self-sacrifice to the whole international community. Che is also demanding, a demanding character that had the fortune of being born into a wealthy family but said no to the temptations and became the man of the people. The people that can muster the virtues of conviction and humanity can say that they are like Che, but above all revolutionaries among revolutionaries. Sankara tells his people that Che's image is found all over the world and is in everyone's mind, and hoped the Burkina people can try to be like him. He then speaks to Che's son Camillo directly, and tells him, we can not speak of you as an orphaned son. Che belongs to all of us. He belongs to us as a heritage belonging to all revolutionaries. Together with us today you are a citizen of Burkina, because you have followed resolutely in your father's footsteps. Sankara wanted his people to remember Che as an embodiment of eternal romanticism, a person with invigorating youth and incredible wisdom. Che was both the heart that spoke and the bold and vigorous hand that took action. Thomas Sankara ends his final speech by announcing that the street they are on will be named Che Guevara Street, and that his legacy will be immortalized in the history of Burkina Faso. He wanted his people to think of Che, and every time they think of him, to try to be like him. Without knowing that this was his final time speaking to his people, Thomas Sankara ends his final speech with his common saying. Homeland or death, we will win. Thank you for watching this video. I hope that you learned some more about the legendary Thomas Sankara from these five speeches, and do your own research on all the great things he has achieved for his people in his short time in office. Thomas Sankara is one of the greatest revolutionaries on the continent of Africa and all over the globe. He is my favorite socialist leader, and I hope I can help the continent in a similar fashion in the future. Thanks again for watching, and remember homeland or death, we will win.